Okay, what I want to do is look at the um, Iranian perspective of the ongoing negotiations. One of the themes of my book is when you do have a high-profile diplomatic engagement, be it with North Korea, be it with the Palestinians, be it with Taliban, be it with Iran, there's a tendency to want to whitewash uh, the regime that's across the table in order to show that this diplomacy and this diplomatic process have hope. And so one of the themes right now, which we see playing out, and I go into it in the last 30 years with regard to the Iranian negotiations, is that oftentimes, or actually right now, we're in the process of whitewashing our opponents to pretend that this diplomacy is a little bit more successful and has a little bit more promise than perhaps it does. First of all, let's be clear. We're sitting down with the Iranians, and we are talking to their diplomats. The Iranians have agreed to talk, but it would be absolutely wrong to say that the reason they're talking is because they want to come to a conclusion on the nuclear dispute. Rather, according to the Iranian Central Bureau of Statistics, in the year before the Iranians came to the table, their economy shrank 5.4 percent. We have, according to different estimates, now given them 7 to 20 billion dollars in sanctions relief and new investment in order to come and actually sit with us in order to start talking about our concerns. I would liken that to giving a five-year-old dessert first and then asking them to eat their spinach at the dinner table. And if the Iranian, if the Iranian motivation was simply to have an economic bailout, well, it's kind of ironic that perhaps the only place where President Obama's stimulus has truly worked has been in Tehran. Now, when it comes to those with whom we're negotiating, we're sitting down with the diplomats. We're not sitting down with the Office of the Supreme Leader, and we're not sitting down with the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. The reason why that's important is because any nuclear program today seems to be run and directed out of the Office of the Supreme Leader, and should Iran decide to build nuclear weapons, they, the command, control, and custody of those would be with the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. Now, some people in Washington and the State Department have suggested that the Supreme Leader has blessed the nuclear talks, but if you actually look at what he said, he talked about heroic flexibility, but when he defined that in Persian, it was a change in tactics, not a change in policy. Therefore, the policy continues to be the nuclear drive, we're just feign a little bit more flexibility. When it comes to the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, they've given their answer non-verbally with the reports that they're sending a flotilla of ships close to American shores. In the last couple weeks, both my wife Anya and I work and write for the Foreign Military Studies Office at Fort Leavenworth and their Operational Environment Watch. We've had senior Iranian Revolutionary Guard officials who have said that the Americans have never been weaker and that the Iranians have every intention of exploiting it. I'm talking about the second in command of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps and so forth. And those translations and that analysis will be out on Monday from the um, Operational Environment Watch website at the Foreign Military Studies Office at U.S. Army Fort Leavenworth. Now, as we move forward, the question is, have these agreements done what we even say they would. And while I'm going a little bit off topic, one of the episodes which I look at a great deal in my book is the North Korea negotiations. Now, in 1999, the General Accounting uh, Office had determined that North Korea was indeed cheating when it came to the disposition of heavy fuel, oil, and food aid. What's actually interesting when you look at the GAO reports is that the State Department objects to the GAO reports on the grounds that such reporting, reporting a fact, can get in the way of diplomacy. Now, the lesson, and of course, Wendy Sherman was one of the negotiators there. The lesson which seemed to have been learned was not that they should negotiate a better deal, but rather you keep the deal secret so that no one can have to, can use your own metrics and accountability against you. Now, one of those issues. I, in January, I'd gone to Syria and Iraq, and earlier this month, I was in Kuwait and the United Arab Emirates. And one constant thing I was hearing, especially among our allies in Kuwait and the United Arab Emirates, is that they're not, they don't think that the Iranians are actually going to cheat on the deal. 
They're just afraid that we're rushing a deal so quickly and without taking any input from those who actually know and understand the Iranian behavior that we are going to be leaving loopholes so big you can drive a tank through them. And that ultimately is another concern and one of the concerns with regard to the State Department's refusal to really allow its agreements to come up for inspection to allow them, if you will, to go before a murder board in order to try to pick out by the letter of law whether there's any way the Iranians can maneuver around the way things are written. Unfortunately, too often we're afraid to walk away from the negotiating table. Um, the last point I would make, and this I'm drawing as a conclusion from the book rather than necessarily what the Iranians say, because I'm not only I, I've talked before about what the Iranians have said about Hassan Rouhani's, for example, February 9th, 2005 speech where he outlined the doctrine of surprise, where you lull the Americans into complacency and then you give them a knockout punch. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not going to rehash the old rhetoric, but one conclusion I t took from the book whether in Iran, in North Korea, in the Palestinian Authority, or elsewhere, is that the, one of the greatest canaries in the coal mine with regard to whether a rogue regime is really changing its attitude and coming in from the cold is, maybe not in this room, but the seemingly unrelated issue of religious freedom and religious liberty. And if these regimes are still targeting their Christians, their Jews, their Baha'is, and so forth, chances are, if we are saying that they are reforming, they're not. We're simply creating a whitewash, creating a facade. And if you really want to see a metric which you can push up against the historical record, that metric tends to be whether the regimes will suddenly start to really change their attitudes and come in from the cold. But with that, I've raised a few issues. Obviously, we're nervous looking ahead at the seeming desperation this administration has to make a deal. I worry a great deal about the new emphasis on track two diplomacy, because back the last time we had a large aspect of track two diplomacy in the year 2000, the Iranians gave, we gave the Iranians 22,000 visas, they gave us 700 visas. And the Iranians, in short, would only give visas to people that would amplify what the Iranians wanted to hear, that terrorism wasn't a big deal, that nuclear weapons wasn't a big deal, that resistance was legitimate, and so forth. Um, so unfortunately, it seems we're making a lot of the same mistakes, but I suspect everyone in this room knows that. And with that, um, questions? Well, Michael, that's a, <clears throat> a dim forecast, just as I expected. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, let me just ask one question of my own and then open it up. Um, what would you, how would you gauge the view of Iran from Iraq these days? Well, you know, this is one of those ironies. First of all, I see much more traffic between Iraqi Kurdistan and Iran than I do in southern Iraq in the Shiite areas. And I think I may have mentioned in this crowd before that I was in Basra this past summer. Now, in Basra, they finally opened up a new bridge across the Shatha Arab, a bridge that was constructed with American money. The governor of Basra decided that the day for the opening would be June 4th, and it would be marked with celebrations. Well, June 4th is the anniversary of the death of the Ayatollah Khomeini. So the Iranian ambassador said, you can't do this. And so the governor of Basra, which again is an overwhelmingly Shiite province, decided to double the display of fireworks, and they could be seen all the way from Khoramshar inside Iran. So while the Iranians were mourning the death of Ayatollah Khomeini, seemingly the Iraqi Shiites were celebrating it. Um, that said, as we look ahead, the, of course, Iraq is going to be going to elections in April, I think April 30th offhand, and there's a great deal of political maneuvering there which we need to be concerned about. Um, Prime Minister Maliki is under the influence of Iran. That may not be how he feels in his heart, but the Iraqis have traditionally balanced America and Iran off each other to create some independent space. By not having a presence there, we undercut Maliki's leverage. Suffice to say, Maliki is, at this point in time, Iran's man in Baghdad. Now, at the same time, Netshirvan Barzani, the prime minister of the Kurdistan Democratic Party, with whom many Americans have tight relations, is considered to be Iran's man in Erbil. And very certainly, he deals a great deal with Iran. That, that's no mystery. Now, one of the things to watch are two things to watch. First of all, who's going to be the next president of Iraq? Jalal Talabani is still hospitalized in Germany after a stroke a year ago December. 
He's paralyzed, he can't talk, and he can't walk. He's mentally impaired at this point. They've released two photos over the past 14 months, but photos, there's a reason they're not releasing videos. So who's going to be the next president of Kurdistan? Increasingly, the rumor seems to be that Masoud Barzani might be. And that may seem counterintuitive. After all, Masoud Barzani, he's a Kurdish nationalist. But he's the same Kurdish nationalist that invited Saddam Hussein up into Erbil in 1996. He's a Kurdish nationalist so long as that rhetoric gets him something. But he's interested in power and interested in titles. Now, the logic is, and the Iranians seem to be brokering this deal, you put Masoud Barzani in the honorific pre um, position as Iraqi president. Barzani can keep up with the Talibanis. Nechavan Barzani remains prime minister in a stronger premiership without a president in Kurdistan. So Iran consolidates control over Erbil. And at the same time, the Kurds throw their support to Maliki. And Maliki consolidates control. Iran has the whole country. But even if you look at pro-American officials like Barham Saleh, who's the president of the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan, many people in the room know him. Well, the PUK, that political movement, has been um, undergoing a, a leadership crisis. So who's been brokering the deal to unravel the leadership crisis and to create a new leadership for the PUK? It hasn't been the United States. It hasn't been the American embassy and er, um, consulate in Erbil. It's been the Islamic Republic of Iran, which has been um, meeting with the PUK officials, has determined that Barham Saleh should be the next secretary general, Qubad Talabani will be his deputy, and Darbaz Kosrat, the son of former Prime Minister Kosrat Rasul, should be his other deputy. The point being that when the Iranians are brokering the steel among um, even the most pro-American officials, it really does suggest the hemorrhaging of American influence, even among the Kurds, who we seem uh, to believe are our allies. And Pollock. Hi, thanks. The debate amongst people who are uh, opposed to the president's policy, uh, one of them is about whether or not this is all just a complete um, mess up and lack of strategy on the administration's part, or if they have some goal that they're just really badly attempting to come to. Uh, it's been suggested that the president is really a disciple of uh, Walt in his uh, you know, belief, uh, almost idiotic belief, that Iran can be turned into a force for stability in that part of the world uh, with, and bury their hatchet with the United States. I was wondering where you came down on that discussion. Is there actually an administration policy that they're executing badly, or do they really not know what they're doing at all? As I often say, I'm a historian, so I get paid to predict the past, and I usually only get that right half the time. But my biggest academic disagreement with Walt and the realist argument is that it doesn't place a value on the importance of allies and the importance of friendship. And this is something which I certainly hear in the Gulf. One of those issues that we should be looking forward to or, or looking at is the fact that the Iranians and the United Arab Emirates are negotiating over the fate of the disputed islands that the Iranians seem to be um, willing to strike a deal in which they will leave the islands and allow the UAE to establish sovereignty, but the Iranians will keep control over the waters. This is sort of like a Caspian parallel. It's the control over the waters that concerns us. At the same time, as people begin not to trust the United States, and this is what should really concern everyone in this room, the Omanis, and the Sultan of Oman has been a consistent ally of the United States, are making a deal with Iran, and it's been reported open source and defense news, I was hearing about it in the Gulf quite a bit, to allow the Iranians a base on the Musandam Peninsula, right on the other side of the Strait of Hormuz, in order, in, in exchange for, um, for some oil concessions and so forth, for being get, sold cheap oil. Well, the Sultan, even if it's just a port facility, the Sultan of Qaboos is eventually going to die. And if the Iranians have a presence there, presence is 99% of the law. And if they decide to militarize that in any post-transition error in Oman, that's going to be a problem for us when the Iranians have a presence on both sides of the Strait of Hormuz. This is ultimately what we have when our allies don't trust us, so they feel they have to make accommodation with our adversaries. On the second part of your question, I would say simply that President Obama, and perhaps Walt as well, don't understand that international relations, international relations isn't simply grievance-based. What we're up against is an ideology as well. 
And while in the future, I do think that the Iranians could be a pillar of pro-American um, presence in the Middle East once the regime ends like they were before. The fact of the matter is, it's the guys with the guns that matter. The Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps is indoctrinated into an ideology. They're, they would be the ones who would control any nuclear weapons program. And ultimately, they're the ones with whom we have to deal. I mean, or we have to realize, represent the reality of the problems coming from Iran. Yes, Maury. <clears throat> have you seen or talked to anyone who has actually seen the document, the text, of the interim ag agreement? No. And there's been talk, and I'm just reading this open source, that you can go into a facility in the Capitol, and as long as you give up your pencils, your pens, any sort of camera, that you can see this unclassified agreement. But ultimately, it seems that the Obama administration doesn't have a great deal of self-confidence in its negotiators, because if it did, you wouldn't be able to see this at the same time. We keep hearing very disturbing issues. First of all, the Iranians will say certain things aren't covered in the agreement, which the Americans say are covered in the agreement. Um, anything from new experimentation with um, centrifuge technology to, for example, what happens with regard to the Parchin plant to some of the issues with regard to the ballistic missiles. Whenever the Iranians express a grievance and say this will ruin the negotiations, we back down. I mean, this agreement seems to be highly problematic simply because we won't let it see the light of day. I will, sorry, if I could just say, I have no problem with negotiating in secret. I have problems with the agreements being secret. By the way, I, I would just point out that a lot of what you're saying, Michael, in terms of what each side has to say about the same agreement seems to have echoes of the New START Treaty negotiations with the Russians and how we couldn't come to any agreement with the Russians as to the meaning of missile defense. I mean, that, and that, that's, that, that's produced problems that we're seeing the ramifications of today in a lot of ways. Um, Wayne, did you have a question? Michael, in your uh, travels to our allies, uh, Kuwait and Arab Emirates, who do they, did you hear any talk of who they regard in, the, in our Congress, Senate House, are the who they look to in terms of uh, foreign policy leaders here in the United States absent absent of uh, you know the shambles that Obama's made of our foreign policy they, they don't tend to look at um, at the issue with that degree of precision and they're not trying they're not identifying specific actors in the Senate or in the Congress whom they can trust they're looking holistically at the breadth of U.S. foreign policy, and let's also face it, many people in the region don't fully understand the importance of Congress when it comes to foreign policy. Yes, the Iraqis sometimes do because of the Iraq Liberation Act, but the fact of the matter is, part of that is the fault, if I may, of the Congress itself, because it seems that it has been less than willing to, um, to pull its punches and use its oversight as effectively as it could uh, from the days 20 years ago with Jesse Helms and so forth. Time for one more question, if there is one. Fred. I was going to ask you about the agreement, and there is also a secret side agreement, I understand. Um, uh, let me ask you a few It's like double secret probation. Yeah, I'm just wondering, and that was supposed to be shared with Congress. I hope someone in this room has seen it. So basically, isn't it true Iran has said they're not going to give up centrifuges? Yes. They're not going to give up enriched uranium? They're not going to do anything that's not going to let, let me Iraq. cut this short. They're not going to do anything that has been required of them from six unanimous or near unanimous UN Security Council resolutions because the great multilateralist President Obama has unilaterally waived all of that. Because I, I think we're both troubled. What can this agreement achieve? If Iran is giving up nothing and we're giving them sanctions relief, I, where, where is this going to go? I, I mean, how long will this? Th this building be fooled by this agreement. Well, and let me just, if I can, um, counter a point you didn't make, um, because it's more interesting than countering a point you did make. Uh, when we look at this, uh, let's use the most conservative numbers, the $7 billion in sanctions relief, that's for six months. So in effect, if we want to keep the process going, we're going to have to pay the Iranians another $7 billion. On top of which, some people will say that 
The problem with these sanctions is that China or Russia would simply fill the void, and so we're just undercutting the American financial position um, to start with. But to the people who say that, I would point out that the Iranian Central Bureau of Statistics had said that even with such investment, the Iranian economy had shrank 5.4 percent. So they don't need any money. They need American technology, European technology and investment, and unfortunately that's what we're giving them. Leverage seems to be a dirty word. A final theme of the book is I'm not against diplomacy. And when Hillary Clinton or Obama say, if you're not going to talk to your friend, uh, enemies, then who are you going to talk to? They fundamentally, and they, they point out that Ronald Reagan talked to Gorbachev. What they refuse to understand is that for Reagan, talk was the end of the process that came after a multi-year military buildup rather than the beginning of the process, but unfortunately leverage has become a dirty word. The last point I would make is in researching this, because it's a half, it's a half century of U.S. engagement with rogue regimes and terrorist groups. Of course we all know that the military spends more time in the classroom going over lessons learned than they do in the field to make them, to identify mistakes, make themselves better soldiers, sailors, and pilots. Never once in the last half century has the State Department conducted a lessons learned exercise, and it shows. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to let Admiral Lyons close us out. You know, he had one last question. Yeah, Michael, as you know my views pretty clearly, uh, here we got a country that's been at war with us for 34 years, caused thousands of American deaths, including their participation in 9-11. And in a recent op-ed I did, no matter what evidence we have, we have always found an excuse not to take action. And I've got to say, what would an agreement with Iran mean anyway? In the, in the concept of Takiyari, what does it mean? And therefore, you know, I think this is all nonsense of what we're doing. I mean, this is self-destruction. And it seems to me, and of course we keep getting weaker and weaker by the day, and our leverage to enforce any of our objectives um, is substantially reduced. And the only thing I think we should do today, which would probably make this administration vomit, I would be transferring the bunker buster bombs to Israel, I would be transferring the tankers so they could successfully carry out a strike. And I'd even throw in a squadron of F-15 aircraft. If you do that, you suddenly might upset the negotiating balance. And at least then Israel would be in a much better position to carry out a successful strike, and which place we should be positioning ourselves to counter any follow-on Iranian action. Well, if, if I may, I appreciate your comments, even though, as usual, I find them a little bit too liberal for my tastes. But, <laughs> but just one, That's a first. one episode, um, again, from my recent trip to the Persian Gulf, as the Iranians are talking about withdrawing from Abu Musa, at least the land area, one, it turns out that they've been storing CW on Abu Musa. And the Emiratis, according to some reports, have been wanting satellite imagery to monitor the Iranian cleanup and withdrawal from Abu Musa, so they approached the United States and the Pentagon hemmed and hauled and wouldn't give them the satellite imagery they needed for reasons of classification, and so the United Arab Emirates went to the Russians instead. That's, that's how we treat our allies in the age of Obama. <laughs>